murky water, I would have lost my shit, but so would everybody else, because, you know, elevator full of murky water. That was Roach. Trying to call everybody down. No, Roach, no, and, uh, you said I don't have a problem with Oh, it's over just the top. state I was so, in last so night. So basically, Roach runs the elevator. Like, well, <laughs> there was a little of that going around. Hi, I'm Abend, and I love mudkips. This is my talk. <laughs> this is a quote from Timothy Leary, basically saying that LSD was just kind of a starting point. Septal, the septal region of the brain is kind of what is referred to as the pleasure center by some people. And electrical stimulation there is extremely pleasant. It's part of the brain's reward system. Wireheading is the application of electronics to influence the brain through things like stimulation of the septal region, which is, at this point, not practical for do-it-yourselfers. I'm going to be going through some stuff that is practical for do-it-yourselfers, and then moving on to future directions for wireheading. The work that I'm doing is kind of a work in progress, so I'm not going to be overly focused on code. Um, I have technical information with me, so if people want to get into the nitty gritty of it, catch me after the call talk. That's the basic schematic of wireheading. You've got your brain, something capable of sensing the state of your brain, like an EKG, or a, rather an EEG, computer for processing the signal, and then something capable of influencing the state. This is the Cirrus Mind Machine, which is basically a set of goggles that blink lights at your eyes. It's also known as a photic driver. So I'm going to go over sensors first, uh, do-it-yourself sensors, that is. First one is a heart rate sensor, EKG or ECG. Very simple, easy to build. The most expensive part is that one chip, which is an instrumentation amplifier that costs maybe $15, unless you salvage it out of old, broken stuff. Um, basically, all it does is amplify the voltage difference between the electrodes on the chest and filter out any noise that is common to both signals, so you don't get as much 60 hertz AC hum as you would expect, and you get a nice display on, say, an oscilloscope, or because of the attenuation from these resistors, it's actually around one volt peak to peak and can go directly into a sound card for recording and software analysis. Um, with something like this, you can actually sense, uh, on a very broad scale, somebody's emotional state. Being emotionally aroused, rather up, will cause a higher heart rate than being relaxed. But of course, it can also be thrown off by physical activity, which will jack your heart rate up as well. People use stuff like this for biofeedback, which is actually consciously being able to affect stuff that's generally regarded as unconsciously controlled, like heart rate. You can actually bring your heart rate down by trying to increase the spacing between the pulses. And you may have seen these on TV before. It's the device that goes ee right after the doctor goes, we're losing him. It's bad when it does that. Trust me, I know. Yeah. There's also the open EEG which is yet another nondescript metal box. It's got, this one has two channels, but it's actually expandable to six channels and does essentially the same thing. It amplifies a voltage difference between two sensors, which are applied to the head to pick up groups of neurons, fire, the electrical change caused by groups of neurons firing in the brain. A filter to basically cut off everything above, I want to say designed for 50 hertz because while there is brainwave activity above that level, there's also a whole lot of interference from power lines, 60 hertz in the US, 50 hertz everywhere else. And it also includes an analog to digital conversion stage so that it can just throw the data over a serial port to a listening computer. And there is something of a software environment around this for monitoring the, what brainwaves are being produced, sorting them out according to frequency. Um, there's not a lot of software, though, for driving effectors like the blinking light goggles, and that's what I'm aiming to fix. Influencers like the blinking light goggles, um, there are a variety of types, are used to drive brain waves. Uh, essentially, if you have oscillators that can influence each other, they'll tend to fall into synchrony. Um, the oldest example that I'm aware of is that if you run a pair of clocks on a shelf, they'll actually be able to influence each other slightly through vibration and will eventually fall into sync assuming they're not disturbed by anything else, like being wound regularly. Um, this is a very early 
brainwave synchronizer. It actually says brainwave synchronizer in like it's old font. Beta range, alpha range, and delta range settings, and a brilliant strobe light. Nowadays, we have LEDs, which make it a lot easier. Um, a lot of the hobbyist ones use red LEDs because red actually gets through the eyelids very well. There are a bunch of companies that will sell you for multiple hundreds of dollars goggles with a variety of LEDs, and they generally toot being able to change color as a feature. I'm not sure that it's as important as being able to change frequency, which is pretty easy under software control or with these devices. They also have you know, a little control box. I'm writing a little bit of software for driving goggles, basically just driving them off the parallel port that will interface with the EEG. Uh, the intent being that I can put the EEG on, find out what the dominant frequency of my brainwaves is, and then drive the goggles at just under or just over that frequency to try to move to a different range in a kind of controlled and gradual manner, as opposed to just slapping the goggles on and waiting for something to happen. Um, interestingly, just slapping the goggles on does cause something to happen. You end up getting patterns, swirling colors, uh, blinking lights. I've heard people say that they saw an eye looking at them, that they could see their hands which is kind of a trick when you're wearing opaque goggles and have your eyes closed. This is a quote from Brian Geisen, who was a beat poet, an artist, uh, developer of the data cut-up technique, um, friend of William S. Burroughs, also a friend of Ian Somerville and Walter, Dr. W. Gray Walter, who did a lot of work on brainwaves. Um, he was driving in Marseille in France, ran through a long avenue of trees and had his eyes closed but was looking towards the sun. So the trees would interrupt the light coming by and saw a swirling storm of colors. That works. I've done it. Um, don't do it while you're driving. Get somebody else to drive. Interestingly, Buddhist transition, or tradition holds that Buddha was enlightened after seven days meditating under a tree. So one might theorize that the light interrupted by the branches of the tree, uh, if one were prone to trivializing other people's religions, <laughs> caused visions, um, which actually look remarkably like this. This is a Buddhist mandala held to be a conceptual map of the universe. It bears a striking resemblance to something called a form constant, which is the sort of patterns seen, especially in closed eye visuals from hallucinogens and from the goggles, and is generally caused by stimulation of an area of the visual cortex in patterns caused by the underlying structure of the visual cortex rather than by external stimuli. So essentially, the visual cortex is across the back of the head. And if you were to, say, stimulate banks of nerves in rows, you would see something remarkably like a tunnel of swirling light, which is exactly what you see with the goggles or, I'm told, with hallucinogens. Um, of course, I've messed it up for all of you by telling you what you'll see. The um, expectation is very powerful in terms of developing the, what, the visuals. At one point, I was wearing the goggles, and everything appeared to be swirling in one direction. So I held my hands up like this. This is with my eyes closed and with opaque goggles on, so I can't even see my hands. I went like that. And of course, since I expected that it would alter the direction of the swirl, it actually did. Everything stopped and then swirled in the other direction. So there's a lot of your own conscious influence there. Uh, flashing lights have had other effects. I'm sure you all heard about this. In China, or no, Japan rather, there was an episode of Pokemon called Goto Denshi Paragon or something like that where they were in a computer. And Pikachu unleashed its electrical attack which looked like this only with the red switching to blue at a frequency of 12 hertz which is I believe around the edge of the alpha to beta brainwave frequency transition. Some people had seizures. The actual number of people influenced is unknown at this point because the media picked it up and there was a whole lot of people who had symptoms not caused by this but by mass hysteria. The symptoms of photosensitive epilepsy are closer to seizures, a tonic clonic or absence seizures, people locking up or beginning to twitch violently. Uh, the symptoms of, yes? Yes, this, this actually came out recently. There was a, um, a group of griefers posted to an epilepsy forum 
a whole bunch of images and JavaScript that blinked at frequencies calculated to cause seizures <laughs> and um, to do things like take over people's computers and display on the full screen so that they saw nothing but seizure-inducing visuals. There was at least one person who locked up for several minutes until her son saw what was going on, turned her away from the computer, and shut it off. Yet, yeah, so it's gone to, hey, look, instead of just pissing people off, you can actually attack them through the internet. Nobody died, but it's entirely possible that somebody would, for example, be standing up, lock up, fall down, clock themselves on a coffee table on the way down, and that would be the end of them. Congratulations, you just killed someone through the internet. It's actually pleasant. Yes? Uh, how long do you have to look at the image to, for it to cause a seizure? I don't know. Like yeah, it, it will vary on the person. Uh, the, the question was, how long do you have to look at an image to have seizures? There are some people who are sufficiently sensitive that strong patterns are enough to trigger a seizure. There are other people who are undiagnosed until they slap goggles on and the only thing they can see is blinking lights. Most strobe lights in clubs are actually constrained from going below a certain frequency by law because otherwise somebody might walk into the club and have a seizure. Um, it actually kind of ends up playing into the motif of harmful perception, which I'm kind of interested in because I'm an H.P. Lovecraft fan. H.P. Lovecraft had a bunch of monsters where if you look at them, you go mad. Like their existence is not compatible with the human brain. And that, gets, that shows up in literature remarkably often. Um, most famous example, Medusa, see her turn to stone. Um, Lady Godiva, the original peeping Tom was a tailor named Thomas, who, according to legend, drilled a hole in his shutters so he could look out the window when Lady Godiva rode through Coventry naked except for her hair and was struck blind by her beauty, or possibly her husband. <laughs> in the Bible, in the Judeo-Christian Bible, that is, um, seeing God is fatal. Like, there is essentially a quote, no one shall see God and live. Um, God always appears behind clouds or in forms that are not his true form, as it were. And certain religions don't even say certain names of God, using, for example, Hashem, which means the name, and I've just terribly mispronounced. And Tetragrammaton, which basically just means four-letter word, instead of a four-letter word for God. Um, if you want to look this up, the slides have tons of notes. The link to the Wikipedia page, which has like a bojillion examples. It's like curiously recurring phenomenon. There's also some good science fiction stories that way. Um, moving away from the eyes to the ears, there's something called a binaural beat, which is binaural meaning two ears or two hearing apparatus. Um, it plays two frequencies separated by a very small amount, so 300 hertz and 310 hertz, for example, which are combined in the brain to form, well, in the brain or in the head. It's, it could be a matter of a head-related transfer function, which is basically the acoustic alterations in sound caused by the fact that you have like five pounds of meat and water between your ears. Um, but at any rate, they blend and you end up hearing kind of a wah, 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 wah kind of effect. And it's the same idea as the goggles. The, the brain waves will synchronize to the modulated wah, wah tone. There's a ton of software available for this. If you're interested in getting into these things, that's probably the cheapest way to go because you just put a pair of headphones on and download some free software. Um, techno music. Loud, repetitive beats, as I believe the British called it when they tried making legislation to ban it. Um, characterized by very high beats per minute, which is interesting because one could theorize that a combination of set and setting, and possibly also the drugs, could be used to induce a trance state. And drumming to induce a trance state is actually a common thread in some shamanistic religions, especially I want to say Russia and Inuit religions. The drumming and dancing continuous activity as a way of inducing an ecstatic state, a trance. Who do magic box is serious business. This is a CES device that isn't made anymore. It was marketed um, for hedonism. CES is cranial electrostimulation, also called, I think, electrosleep, because a lot of the initial research was into causing people to go to sleep, essentially, by running electricity through their brains. The way it works is applying a square wave across electrodes mounted, essentially, behind the ears. And 
Depending on who you ask, Voodoo Mar Bad Night Magic Box's marketing department or everybody else, it's either good in repeated use as sort of an anxiety diminisher and mood brightener, or you'll get wicked high, man. I actually built one of these. Um, electronically, they're very simple. Generating a square wave is, well, you have anybody here who was here for the um, circuit bending talk yesterday? No? OK. There's a device called the Atari Punk console. The difference between this device and the Atari Punk console is the value of the resistors in the output stage. That's it. It's a dead simple circuit, like one chip. The schematics are available on the internet. <laughs> the final frontier of home brain modification will probably be TMS for the next little while. TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is a coil of wire, essentially. And then the cable goes off to a power supply capable of dumping rather a lot of power through there to induce a magnetic field, which in turn induces a current in the underlying brain tissue. Hits an area several centimeters wide and can have a variety of effects depending on where it's placed. There was one researcher who developed a wand that you could put over somebody's speech centers and cause them to be in unable to talk briefly. The effect basically well, at least the theory is that it's caused by causing all the neurons in that area to fire and then take a while to recover, known as virtual lesioning. In research, it's used generally for functional brain mapping. You can give somebody a test that will test a certain ability, for example, um, manipulation of three-dimensional objects, and then target an area of their brain with this in an attempt to give them a virtual lesion in that area and see if it decreases their ability on the test. If it does, then it's very likely that the area that you put your virtual lesion on was actually required for doing that task, uh, which speeds it up considerably because before then you'd have to find people who had actual lesions on their brain, which are, thank God, fairly rare. The device that looks remarkably like a gun there is actually developed as a migraine zapper. Um, the intent being that somebody who has migraines will generally see an aura, which is swirling colors and patterns. It's kind of hard to describe to somebody who doesn't have migraines, and anybody who does have migraines already knows. The idea here was that you'd apply this thing to the back of your head, hit the button, and interrupt the migraine in the process of forming. People claim it works, but it's not exactly um, available to home users. Regulation of this sort of thing is a very weird, a very weird thing in the U.S. Um, drugs are highly regulated. You end up with having to do tons and tons of trials, not only prove that the drug is harmless, but that it does what it says it does, and that it doesn't do a variety of other bizarre things. Medical devices get kind of a free pass. If you don't make any medical claims, you can sell anything you want to anybody, and if they get hurt, well, they can sue you, I guess. If you're actually making medical claims, the primary thing you have to do is prove to the FDA that the device won't immediately harm someone. That's kind of a weird distinction when it comes to brain um, tampering, because, for example, TMS hasn't been around very long. There aren't any long-term cases of people who have been using TMS a lot yet. And if there is something wrong with it, we won't know for a while. Excuse me, what's that thing called? The gun thing? The gun thing was, uh, I believe they were calling it a migraine zapper. It's basically, a, if you search around for TMS, and I can find the actual link to that, that's the researcher that developed it, demonstrating that you can shoot. Um, building one of these at home, bit tricky. Uh, you need to be good at handling high voltage, high current electricity. If you've ever built a Tesla coil, I think this would probably be of similar level of complexity. So if you haven't, build the Tesla coil first. It'll impress all your friends. <laughs> Closing the loop is bringing the sensors and the effectors together, talking to each other in an attempt to basically automate doing all this stuff. Um, that's what I was working on, and I don't have a huge amount of code because I ended up having to write a presentation. <laughs> um, I have a little bit. I'm glad to go into it, but it's you know it's a code. It's a lot of typing. It's not terribly exciting. 
I'd rather go into other methods of influencing the brain, some of which you can also do at home, but they didn't exactly fall into the sensor or effector loop that I was talking about. Lucid dreaming is one of them. That's dreaming, but being aware that you are dreaming and in conscious control of your dreams. The guy looking like wearing electro or electronics on your face is serious business is Philip Tyrone from Make. Make has had how to build goggles, how to do mushroom farming, and how to grow plants hydroponically in a variety of issues. Um, this may be the Californian influence, but the device he's wearing is basically two lights pointed at the eyes, a timer, a battery, and a turn it on switch. And that's all it is. If you turn it on and then go to sleep, 90 minutes or so later, it blinks a light at you. That's your cue to do a reality check. If you're dreaming and you do something like look at your watch, allegedly digital displays look like nonsense, or you might be able to do something like, gee, can I fly? No, I must be giving a presentation instead of dreaming that I'm giving a presentation. The, there are more complicated versions. You can get ones, for example, that monitor uh, light reflection from the surface of your eyes to determine if your eyes are moving, and then if you're in REM sleep, they'll blink the goggles and it's your cue to do the reality check. Um, you can also just do it by discipline and training and not have to buy a bunch of equipment, but you know, capitalist system, you know, people will sell you anything they think you'll buy. Um, sensory isolation is another way of messing with your senses uh, with multiple applications. The device up here is a float tank, which is basically a bathtub insulated and sound deadened, full of water containing usually a lot of Epsom salts to make it more dense and to allow people to float in it. And the point being that you go into this thing and float in silence and without a lot of visual, auditory, or tactile stimulation and drift into a relaxed state. Um, this guy, on the other hand, is in Guantanamo Bay and has mittens that prevent him from feeling anything, blacked out goggles, mask, earmuffs. That's very bad. Um, sensory deprivation is very dependent on set and setting. If you're in your own home, you know, dressed in your bathing suit, smiling and happy, it can be very, very relaxing. If you're surrounded by people with guns who hate you and tend to sick dogs on people, it's not going to be relaxing. In fact, it's torture. People debate this, but no, it's torture. I mean, there's no two ways around it. I mean, I'm sure that ask any of these people, they're not relaxed. Oh. Well, it comes up in pop culture a bunch of places. Twilight Zone, also the movie Altered States, which was, um, yeah, it turns into a monkey, turns into a blob. No, relaxing in a tank will not turn you into a blob. This was actually kind of, when I say based on a true story, I mean, there was a researcher named John C. Lilly who did a lot of work with float tanks. He also eventually did a lot of work with talking to dolphins and is regarded as something of an eccentric. This was a video that was very popular on the internet, uh, I believe a year and a half ago. Uh, the guy in the background has a remote control and the woman in the foreground has a galvanic vestibular stimulator, which basically <laughs> runs electricity through the inner ear. The difference between it and the CES device, the cranial electrostimulation, is pretty simple. It's a DC power supply rather than a square wave. What it causes is a sense of being unbalanced that you can't correct by moving. So if you apply this to somebody and you have the positive terminal on one side and the negative terminal on the other side, I believe they move towards the negative terminal. They feel like they're falling the other way and they compensate and keep compensating because it doesn't work. If you have a remote control, you can change which way they try to compensate and drive them around like a toy car. <laughs> this isn't the kind of mind control you would want if you were, say, an evil government because you can't really compel them to do anything. Like, you can sort of make them stumble about but you're not going to get Manchurian candidate assassins or anything this way because you can't compel them, for example, to put the device on or get out of bed in the morning or remain standing up when you start driving them around. Oops. <laughs> um, pardon? You had a question. Ah, question then? The vestibular 
simulator. If you, is that a kind of thing where if you are sufficiently self-disciplined and you say, okay, my inner ears are doing weird stuff, maybe I, you know, the room is spinning, but I can look and see the horizon. Can you disassociate the visual and the vestibular? I've never done it. Um, I have one person in front saying no way. It's like, if, if you're really, really drunk, because something chemically is going on with your brain, you can try and tell yourself, oh, I'm not going to fall over. But if your brain is like, it's like if someone has vertigo, they can tell themselves all they want, I'm not going to fall over. But they will fall over. Because your brain, unfortunately, because the way the brain is, there's actually more than one part. So it can trump anything you think, unfortunately, is how it goes. And remaining upright is kind of a basic level thing. <laughs> so moving beyond stuff, anything that I just showed, you could conceivably build. The galvanic vestibular, vestibular simulator is kind of an academic project. There are schematics and whatnot designs available for it um, if you want to you know, drive your friends around or give them nausea. Um, Moving beyond stuff that you can do at home, well, uh, you could make implants. No, no, no not their implants. Um, an implant designed for spinal pain, uh, back pain. The, there was a researcher developing this device that would essentially stimulate the spine via implanted wires for cases of back pain that were unresponsive to pain medication and surgery. While they were testing the electrode placement, the subject, who had to be conscious for the uh, testing, because otherwise they can't get any feedback, said, you're going to have to teach my husband to do that. Um, slams on her husband aside, they had found a spot on the spinal column where stimulation causes a sensation similar to an orgasm. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen this movie, but the thing on his arm is an orgasm gun. <laughs> and if you haven't seen the movie, go see it. It's hilarious. Um, the thing is, the marketing for this and the testing is a little bit weird. Um, I'm sure some of you are going, <laughs> he doesn't know, <laughs> nerd. But the social construction of sex is such that um, male impotence tends to get underreported. Or impotence is probably a bad word. but. Um, Orgasmic dysfunction. Possibly because virility is viewed as an aspect of manliness. A guy who can't perform, and I use the term perform informally because there is like a very much performance element to male sexuality, at least in the cultures that I'm familiar with. Um, <laughs> and the implanted orgasm stimulator, when they were going for tests, requested only women for the testing. <laughs> not men. They didn't get a lot of takers, actually. They got so few takers that they couldn't run the tests. The sample size was too small. But the spinal column is not really a gender-specific organ. The device should work just as well on men as with women. They just didn't occur to them that men might want something like that. Um, the Dalai Lama on <laughs> brain implants. Brain implants are probably going to remain outside of the range of do-it-yourselfers, at least until AIs and surgical robots catch up. Even then, it's weird. Um, brain implants have been researched since, I want to say, the, well, for quite some time. Um, there was a lot of research done by Delgado and Heath in the 50s with deep brain implants. And um, deep brain implants are very curious in that the behavior evoked by stimulation is a lot more integrated with the real situation surrounding the stimulatee. Um, by which I mean, if you stimulate the motor cortex, you'll get a motion. Like basically you'll trigger something like somebody moving their arm or twitching their finger, or kicking their leg, that's craning their neck. But every time you stimulate the same spot, you'll get the same action, and it will be kind of regardless of, for example, them trying to do something else at the time, or them trying to avoid, say, obstacles. If you make them move their arm, they'll knock things over. Deep brain stimulation's actions integrate more naturally with the person's surroundings. There was one patient who had electrodes in, I can't remember exactly where in the brain, but fairly deep level of the brain, and they would stimulate them, and the person would look behind them. But it was a natural motion. They would just turn and look. And 
when they were asked, they would say things like, I thought I heard a noise, or I was looking for my slippers. But every time they hit the button, the person would turn and look and rationalize it. Similarly, they had cats. Uh, cats get used in brain stimulation experiments a lot because cats are basically all the same size. Dogs, not so much. You get a lot of variance in brain size and position, and as a result, they're not mapping research from dog to dog becomes more difficult than cats. Um, they had one point where they could stimulate it and the cat would stretch. But they wouldn't stretch if they were doing something else, like jumping, until they cranked the stimulation level up to a certain point. So they would be able to resist until the stimulation went over a certain level, and then they wouldn't, and would do something like stretching midair and totally fluff their landing. <laughs> Even more creepily, they can evoke um, emotions. Uh, there was obviously the pleasure center, septal electrodes and whatnot, but they also found points where they could evoke murderous rage. There was one patient who threatened to kill the doctor. Fortunately, he was tied down. Well, fortunately is a curious term when you're talking about uh, medical brain implants in... Fortunately for the doctor. Yeah, fortunately for the doctor. But brain implants in an era somewhat before informed consent became the norm. Um, not all is purity and light in the uh, brain implant arrangement. <laughs> Panel from uh, The Invisibles. There are a lot of conspiracy theories, and um, that's probably a bad term because it implies that they're not real, around Delgado and Heath being funded by the government. And they were. This is like a thing you can go research. Delgado received funding from the Office of Naval Research, and Heath was funded by the CIA directly as part of the MKUltra mind control experiments. Um, whether or not the implants were militarized is open to conjecture. Um, obviously, the government wouldn't tell you if they were putting electrodes in, say, soldiers to stimulate rage. Um, it wouldn't be made terribly public. One of Heath's fellow researchers, Harry Bailey, um, was quoted, and this is a secondhand quote that I was leery to use, but I want to drive home that this man was, in fact, evil, not misguided, not unethical in his research, but in fact actually evil, said that it was cheaper to use niggers than cats because they were everywhere and cheap experimental animals. When the magnitude of his misdeeds was uncovered by a royal inquest in Canada, in, uh, not Canada, Australia, faced with the prospect of punishment after they, you know, read through the 12 volume report on bad shit he'd been doing, killed himself. Uh, I don't really regard this as lost brain research. <laughs> Future directions for um, <laughs> brain research. Well, a couple of ways you can go here. I have a transhumanist slant. So, um, actually, one other thing I'd like to mention. Implantation in an unwilling subject would be impractical at best. Um, the brain moves in the skull. There were cases of people who had brain implants who sustained head trauma and had to have the implants moved because their brain had moved and the wires hadn't. Um, they also have to be conscious while the implant is being installed. So if you think for a minute about what that entails, that means being wide awake under local anesthetic while they drill holes in your skull and run wires into your brain. The reason for this is that they need feedback. You know, they'll hit the wire and they go, how do you feel now? Hit it again, how do you feel now? Change the voltage, how do you feel now? Um, it would be a very memorable experience. Um, on to the future. There's a bioethical stance called abolitionism that's um, heavily informed by utilitarianism and is dedicated to the use of bioengineering medical science for the, to the elimination of unwanted suffering. They're basically regarding unwanted pain and turmoil as an engineering problem. Um, among other potentials for this research is the ability to subvert something called the hedonic treadmill. The hedonic treadmill is basically the fact that people have a certain set point level of happiness. There are people who will be sad, more or less whatever happens to them. There are things that will bring them up for a while, and then they'll return to their base level. This is actually borne out by research. There are people who, for example, win the lottery, and you would think, well, now they have no worries. They have all the money they'll ever need. They don't have to worry about 
work, they don't have to do things that suck for money. But after a year or two, they return to just as happy as they were before they won the lottery, just in a bigger house. Being able to crank the set point up is arguably possible at this point. But there are problems. For example, it could be over-applied or applied before it's ready for prime time. Um, this happens. Electroconvulsive therapy and lobotomies spring immediately to mind as a couple of things that work in certain cases as a last resort. But um, when they were developed, were adopted with rather too much enthusiasm. Um, possibly the most famous case is Rose Kennedy, who had a lobotomy, which uh, flattened her affect to the point that she spent most of the rest of her life sitting in a chair. Um, she may have just been not up to the Kennedy level of perfection. Not, a, not necessarily anything terribly wrong with her, but there's lobotomies were popular at the time. Um, the other possibility is if we develop the technology for brain interfacing and so forth, that we end up altering ourselves to a point where we are no longer recognizable as human or as something capable of sustaining states that we would regard as valuable. Um, Nick Bostrom, a transhumanist philosopher, has pointed this out in a paper that there are a couple of potentials that people point out are um, that we'll either outsource everything. For example, if I have the ability to brain interface to a computer, computers are better and faster at math than I am. I can't really take cosine of some humongous number in my head. With a computer, I could. But if I start outsourcing too much stuff, eventually you start losing, you can't say, well, that's Abend. There he is right there. There's no there there. You end up with a collection of processes running, but it might not actually mean anything to the way, in the way that we regard a human life or human mind as meaning something, as having a significance or value. The other possibility is that we'll just screw up and lose emotional states that we regard as important these days. Um, for example, Perhaps we could actually eliminate sadness, period. Nobody ever gets sad again. Well, sadness does have some value. Like, there are certain times when it's appropriate to be sad. And it would be, I think, a loss to humanity if we eliminated it entirely. I actually have the example of a Henri Toulouse-Lautrec written down here. He was an artist. He was also the product of a family tree that had loops in it. His parents were first cousins. As a consequence, he had a variety of medical issues that may have driven him to become one of the best-known post-impressionist painters. We may have been able, using modern medical technology, to fix those problems, and then he wouldn't have become an artist. Maybe. I mean, we can't say for sure. He's dead now. Died at 37 of, the, of syphilis, uh, which also arguably a consequence of his um, unfortunate upbringing. So... It could be that we will somehow impoverish our culture by eliminating... You laughing at <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, but it may be that we'll somehow impoverish our culture by eliminating certain states that perhaps we don't want now, but would, in their absence, be missed. Murderous rage. I would miss murderous rage. <laughs> we have some people in the front who would miss murderous rage. Um, these are not the people that I would let mess with my consciousness. This is actually more or less where I stand on this sort of thing. Um, don't force anything on anyone. It is not your choice what other people should feel. However, you shouldn't be able to... They shouldn't be able to force you to feel things or not feel things. Um... Obviously, I have a bit of a utilitarian, a bit of a techno-future, techno-progressivist bias, so other people are obviously welcome to their own interpretations. There's also some philosophical aspects. <laughs> for example, saying, well, what does it mean for somebody to be happy? Well, you say, they say, I am happy. That's an aspect of identity. But then you wonder, well, if they have an implant that makes them happy, is that implant them? Is that an element of their identity now? Um, people also, interestingly enough, they'll say, I have a cold. I have a cold. I am infected with a virus that causes you know, a runny nose and a sore throat. 
They don't say I am a cold. People will say, however, I am depressed, I am schizophrenic, I am bipolar. Instead of saying, I have a schizoform disorder, I have depression, I have a bipolar condition. So it seems that things that influence the mind cut a little closer to the core of who someone is than perhaps is entirely rational when one gets the ability to modify one's mind interactively. Uh, how are we set for time? Uh, questions? <laughs> you spelled the URL. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, well, that's okay. There's nothing there anyway. Yes, there is an E in Aculi. A C U L E I. For those who missed it. So I have a question. Yes. You called that box nondescript, but isn't nondescript a description? <laughs> yes, nondescript is in fact a description. It's a description of that box there. Which is nondescript. Yes. Yes. I do not currently have any drugs on my person or in my hotel room. Please do not search it. Okay, thanks. Bye. Oh, well, I do have the goggles and so, software to drive them. So uh, you, talk, sorry, you, you yes. talked about closing the loop mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, 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 connecting the sensors with the effectors. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm wondering what, uh, if you could talk more about what you wanted to do with that. Okay, uh, the question is, please talk more about closing the loop between sensors and effectors. What I want to do is be able to have, say, the electrocardiogram and the EEG hooked up, yep. and a software duplication of what information is received from them, which could arguably be said to be symbolic of my mental state. It's not a copy, obviously, but it is measurements taken that way. Um, and use those measurements to control programs that are driving the effectors. So if, for example, I want alpha brain waves to be the predominant frequency in my brain, and I have the EEG running, and I'm up doing something active, thinking consciously about things, focusing, beta will probably be the more dominant frequency. But What's the difference between the brain waves? Uh, the difference between the brain waves I can go into shortly. I have notes on this. Um, Alpha is a more relaxed state, beta is a more active state, essentially, for the purposes of this example. Um, so I can have this detecting what the dominant frequencies are. And then I can have the program that's driving the goggles check the state from the EEG and say, OK, so we're at 14 hertz is fairly high, and we want to move to, say, 8 hertz, in terms of you know, hertz, pulses per second. So drive the goggles at. 13.5, 13.5, my brain waves come into uh, synchronization with the goggles, hopefully. The EEG detects that, updates the state. The goggles program detects that the state has changed, drops the frequency again. And ideally, my brain waves will track the goggles down. And then a timer goes off, say, in the code, and says it's time to wake up, and starts running it slightly above the dominant frequency, tracking the brain waves up back into beta and full wakefulness. So that's the sort of thing that I like to aim for. So why would one want to change the brainwaves from one state to another? Why so would you want to change from beta to alpha or alpha to beta? What um, is the purpose of... The question is, why change your brainwaves? Well, um, certain brainwave frequencies are affiliated with certain mental states. Uh, beta, like I said, with focus, alertness, active processing. Alpha with relaxation, theta with, I believe, sleep and kind of hypnagogic states. I have this written down in here. Um, so that's one argument is that you would simply want to change it in order to affect how your brain is running to do certain tasks better, maybe. If I want to be in beta to write code or I want to be in theta to fall asleep. The other possibility is that I'm a wirehead hedonist freak that was warned about in the slides there and I want to get high without the DEA kicking down my door. So that's a possibility as well. Take that as you will. Take the possibility. <laughs> yes. Anti wireheading legislation. Um, the FDA's regulation of medical devices will curtail some applications from becoming commercial. Um, yeah, the FDA stepped on a guy named Wilhelm Reich who came up with boxes that he claimed focused a certain type of energy that nobody else could prove existed uh, to cure complaints. And because he made a medical claim that could not be backed up by research, 
the FDA burned his books. They actually went rather over the top in uh, stopping him. Was it? <laughs> okay, so orgone <laughs> energy. Come on, you talked about the. Yes. Wilhelm Reich's theories were um, overtly sexual. Orgone energy was the energy of orgasm, essentially. And he was attempting to collect it from the atmosphere and focus it to heal people. <laughs> um, legislation against things like CES devices, it would be possible but unenforceable. Like I was saying, the circuit, there's nothing in this box that you couldn't get at Radio Shack, including the box. Like it's preventing people from doing it would be extremely hard. Um, unenforceability, however, has never stopped the US government from outlawing anything. So it would be possible if it became either a social problem or a moral panic could be whipped up against it. Moral yeah, a moral panic in the United <laughs> States? Never. <laughs> All right, no, no more comments from the peanut gallery. Um, so I don't foresee legislation like that happening, but it's a possibility. Why do you think it's not used for medical devices, like it's an antidepressant or preventing migraines? Uh, the question is, why isn't it more widespread? For example, the use of CES devices, there has been research that said it was good against anxiety and as a mood brightener and as a painkiller. And the question is, well, why hasn't it become more widespread among the medical establishment? Um, part of it is that there is a certain inertia in a field like that to keep doing what appears to be working. And what appears to be working is drugs, pharmaceutical stuff. I'll be, or, or yeah, kind of working. <laughs> However, there is also a financial impetus from um, the pharmaceutical industry to keep selling drugs. I mean, that's what they do. So could there be a conspiracy theory there? Oh, yes. Um, it might not even be a theory. But proving the existence of a conspiracy theory is hard. <laughs> um, there's definitely a financial pressure there. And with a financial pressure in a capitalist system, you don't really need a conspiracy, do you? <laughs> it's like, that's the way it will run. How many lobbyists does it take to prove a conspiracy theory? How many lobbyists does it take to prove a conspiracy theory? Not many. <laughs> yeah. He points out that you can buy the devices, or you can build them, and so it's more the information that's not spread than the actual hardware. Yes? Have you ever done anything with lucid dreaming and different devices to help with that? I haven't yet. Uh, I, it's something I'd be very interested in. I've had dreams where I was aware I was dreaming, but uh, I haven't built any devices yet to do anything with that. Yeah, next speech. Um, this is obviously a work in progress, so I'll have more next year, probably. I've done it a couple times. You know, it's only lasted like a couple minutes. You know, you, you hear people that you know can do it on a, on a you know, as-needed basis when they feel like doing it. Like, they'll have a lucid dream every time they find a variant. Yeah, the statement is that, uh, that some people, uh, that lucid dreaming is a very real thing. Like, it exists. He's done it a couple of times. I've done it a couple of times. Not for very long, but some people can actually do it for quite a while. Sustain, you know, a long dream where they're aware that they're dreaming and in control of the dream world. And since it's all in your mind, you, the control is a lot more than you would expect from, like, the actual world where normal physics applies to you. But the but, idea is that the more you can lucid dream, the more you can have a better life in your seven days. Yeah, the... Yeah, that's certainly a very valid point, that lucid dreams can be used for um, training, essentially, for the real world, uh, seeing you know, how things would go if you did this or that, and also just demonstrating to yourself that you are in control of things, that you, can, that you have that ability and increased confidence. Um... I had not heard that, but it's entirely believable that lucid dreaming would be um, addictive to a certain degree because if you have, you know, if your real life is not as good as your dream life, then why would you choose real life over dreaming? And that is 
to a certain extent, also an argument against wireheading. Um, people with septal electrodes have been known to self-stimulate to the point that they needed to take the clicker away so that the person would get the hell out of the lab. Um, it's one of those things where if the real world is not up to snuff and people have a way out, they'll take it. There was an experiment called Rat Park, actually, that was done um, for testing morphine addiction in rats. Uh, lab rats are raised in an environment that could not be misconstrued as um, natural. They grow up in cages and live in small cages where they don't have a lot of intellectual stimulation or social interaction with other rats. Rat Park was a rat environment that had a whole lot of things they could play with. It had a whole lot of other rats they could play with. It had a lot of space in terms of like unit area per rat available. It also had morphine water available. Rats in normal cages, given the option of water with morphine in it and water that doesn't have anything in it, will take the morphine water every single time. The ones in Rat Park drank the morphine water with um, less than if they had selected the water bottles at random. Morphine apparently doesn't taste pleasant to rats, and so if they don't want to get high, essentially, overcoming the taste barrier is a problem, and they'll drink the other water instead. If, on the other hand, they grow up in little boxes and don't get to play with other rats or anything else interesting, then getting high starts to look like an option. Uh, Ian M. Banks, who is a science fiction author, had a line, he has a culture in his uh, stories that has biotechnology to the degree that a lot of their citizens have implanted drug glands, or engineered drug glands, like they grew up with them. And it's accepted that people have this, and they'll use them. But it's also accepted that if 90% of your population is bombed out of their skull all the time, something's wrong with the real world. And maybe that should be fixed rather than, say, preventing them from getting bombed out of their skull by throwing them in jail. But my biases are showing again. Yes. The, 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 uh, the brain structure of anything that's insufficiently stimulated, in this case the rat, is definitely going to be different. Yeah, as a compensatory thing. Um, that also gets applied in a rearing of children, that it's generally regarded as a good move to give your kids a lot of you know, tactile stuff to play with, interaction with other people, diversity of experience, because it forms more neural connections. And that makes them, it does actually, yes, make them less likely to uh, drink the morphine. <laughs> Are you saying beating your kids makes them magic? Yes, beating your kids and shutting them in a closet will make them drink the morphine water. Thank you very much. Yes, the troll. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Here's a question. You were talking earlier about the, the orgasm thing coming from the spine. Yes. <laughs> do you do that with inductance? That's a very good question and one that I haven't explored yet. The question is, could you induce a current in the spinal region that was stimulated by the orgasm stimulator without running wires into somebody's spine, say via one of the TMS devices, only pointed at their spine instead of at their head? I don't know, but entirely possible. A subject for research, as it were. Yes. If you could possibly get a brain implants as mm -hmm. they are right now, would you, do you think that that's a possibility that you would do if you were able to directly, uh, even with all the problems with brain implants right now, if you were able to directly get them, do you think that's an option that you would consider at this time? The question is, if I could adopt brain implants at the current technology level, would I do so? Like me personally. Um, I would not because the current technology level doesn't integrate well with leading a real life. Um, there are problems, for example, with transdermal implants where they will be um, infected easily. Basically, you've got an open area where the wires are running in. Uh, subdermal implants have battery life problems. There is the whole you get hit in the head, the implants move, and all of a sudden you're stimulating something else. And the brain is not mapped to a sufficient degree to get implants that would enable me to do things beyond what I can currently do. I can already experience pleasure. I can already experience murderous rage, although I try to avoid it if at all possible. Um, there are no brain implants that would make me more than I am. And so I wouldn't adopt them currently. I think we should probably wrap it up. Right. Uh, maybe one last question? Anyone?
Okay, good timing then. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> nice. Well, Hat Canada has like a mirror of their um, what's it? Of their. <laughs> oh wow! Because no. Yeah, yeah, no, like the reason I had Hat Canada up there was that I was emailing like a couple of their guys to be like, "Do you mind if I steal the code from Mescaline?" And they were like, "Yeah, go for it." Never mention it. Ever. Okay, I'll try to avoid it. Kind of a follow-up question to that last one where would you get implants today? Do you think implants, and of course obviously you're guessing about your own future and the future of the technology, but obviously. do you think implants will get good enough in your foreseeable lifetime that you'd want to get them? Um, as a transhumanist, I think my foreseeable lifetime is open-ended.